Welcome to China Tech Talk, a weekly discussion of technology and startups here in China. I'm John Artman, editor in chief of TechNote, and as always, I'm joined by Matthew Brennan, co-founder of China Channel. So this week we are we are bringing you another episode from、um, our time at TechCrunch Shenzhen. We had the pleasure of speaking with John Russell, who covers Asia for、uh, TechCrunch dot com. Uh, and so we we talked about a, a bunch of different things, but one of the things that I think Matt and I were really kind of curious about was asking him, getting him to talk a little bit about what it's like to to cover Asia, to cover what it's like to cover China so closely, but then not not actually live here, not actually experience a lot of these trends as as Matt and I, as Matt and I do. But you know, John's an industry veteran, right? I mean, he's been around for a while. He's written about.、Uh, He covers everything in Asia、um, for for TechCrunch. We don't need to introduce them,、um, and he's got a deep knowledge built up over years、uh, across a wide variety of stuff going on here. So we actually covered a lot,、um, and he's got a lot of interesting things to say. You know, if you if you build up that much knowledge, you're going to see patterns across a variety of stuff. And he's got a a very unique viewpoint. You know, he's based in Asia.、Um, But not within China, and、um, you know he he follows everything, right? It's his job. So、um, I think it's we yeah we we、uh, we had a really good old、um, bit of banter at this one.、Uh, John's a nice guy himself, and、uh, yeah, we 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 I, I think this was、uh, a good conversation. Yeah, I mean it was. I mean I I certainly enjoyed it. I mean I always I always enjoy talking with John because as you say he's just、uh, he's very knowledgeable about a, a lot of different topics. And I think that even at some points in this episode he ends up asking us some questions about about what was going on. It's a little difficult, perhaps, for him to take off that that journalist hat.、Um, but yeah, so it's so we cover a lot of different stuff.、Um, so you know what it's what it's like covering China、um, while 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 not being here. Um, you know, so we look at bike sharing.、Uh, we also look at some broader trends in Asia. So, for example, talking a little bit about selfie apps and the differences in in how do you localize to to different countries in Asia. And we also talked a little bit about、um, Chinese companies、um, going into Southeast Asia. And so, kind of, you know, as as he's covering these companies and and watching them kind of、uh, expand into into his backyard, he he shares some really interesting insights into how. These companies are—they、uh, have different strategies in terms of in terms of what types of verticals they're going into, but then also they have different strategies in kind of in in how they are they are actually localizing,、uh, which was、uh, fascinating to to find out、um, just how savvy you know these these Chinese comp- companies are when that when they're going abroad. And with that, we bring you John Russell. Cool. So, so yeah, John.、Um, thank you, thank you so much for 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 joining us on、uh, on China Tech Talk, actually at the TechCrunch event here in Shenzhen. Thanks for having me. Yes, in person. In person, in person finally. Person. Yeah. Yeah, because actually, John and I, we 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 ended up talking quite a bit over. Well, I say quite a bit. What what, what really what it, what it means is I I bug him. I send him messages on on WhatsApp. And like two days later, he ends up、uh, responding to me. Wow, I need to up my game, majorly. <laughs> oh yeah, so um, you know, we're really excited to have have、uh, have you on for a few different reasons.、Uh, number one, you know, because you are TechCrunch's man in in Asia,、um, and also you know you cover a lot of of China as well.、Um, and so one of the biggest things that we kind of want to talk about is really just you know what is it like, you know, watching China, watching Chinese tech, and all the crazy things. Uh, that happens here, but as an outsider, as someone who's not on the ground and yet is still very familiar with what's actually happening. Because, I, as you guys have said earlier, like I don't speak Mandarin, I don't live here.、Um, you know, I mean, I, I have a keen interest in China, but there's only so 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 far that that can go when you when you don't speak the language and you're not actually here in person. So, I mean, I think a lot of the big companies. They've realised, and their public companies, I guess, have sort of China, so they they have to do a lot of a lot of English English language PR. So you, like your ten cents and your Alibaba's and so on and so forth. So that, I mean, with those guys, it's very easy, and they respond quickly to questions. And I mean, that that's much more of the like the PR game, right? Where you know they have news and they give it to you and so on and so forth.、Mm-hmm. The actual startup stuff is really hard,、um, and I rely on events that we do together. You know, you being Technode and me being、um, TechCrunch to, to see. Trends that are happening, you 
know, uh, it, on a on a on a face to face kind of uh, way. Um, but really, it's just reading other tech blogs like Technode, obviously, uh, and other sort of sort of small ones. Um, finding out who the right people who, who know about certain topics are, um, and having sort of contacts on the ground who you can sort of ping with questions like, is this a big deal? Is this not a big deal? So on and so forth. So, and I think, I mean. Honestly, like TechCrunch has a very skeletal staff across Asia, so it's not just in China. The same for India. There's an Indian underground in India, so it's a similar kind of setup where you have a few people who you, can, you know you can trust um, to help you go beyond the big companies. Obviously, do play the, the, the kind of PR game um, with us with us too. So the answer, the, the short answer is, it's pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when when I write stuff, it's usually. Uh, the best stuff comes from these like tiny little blogs, and, it, and the best stuff is always in Chinese. Yeah. Like, it's like uh, I rarely find something in English that yeah. is you know, good, better than the Chinese stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, well, I think that's that, that's you know that's that's the difficult problem for for a lot of English speakers is that um, you know if you if you're coming at a topic about China in English. And your look and your sourcing is only going to be in English. I think you're going to end up getting a bit of a skewed kind of look at what's, at what's actually happening. I think, in, in, although in some ways it's like there's it's like an ecosystem, right? And the stories start at the bottom with somebody who's either like seen a Weibo post or somebody's Chinese blog, and it goes to the first level, which is the guys that can read, Mandarin. and then we're like the next level above that, right? Where we amplify it, yeah. And yeah. hopefully we give some context to audiences that don't know what the bike sharing companies are that. That well, so hopefully we, we, we still add value somewhere in that chain, right? But we're not obviously as as low down as we could be if we had someone right. who was actually here right. on the ground in, in person. Really. But but I guess I guess one of the one of the big questions is again like kind of as an outsider who, who follows everything, like what's what's been your kind of like oh my god I can't believe this is this is happening, or like what you know. What's, what's been like the most confusing thing? If you asked me like five years ago, that'd be really easy to answer because I would have been so new to it. I might be like, yeah, like this thing or that thing, but everything seems to be quite cyclical. I think some of the like um, the way the government censors things, can we talk about this? Yeah, I think fine. we probably can, right? Like, that stuff is kind of crazy to me. Like, how, I mean, just the other day, like, uh, I've seen a Weibo like just cut off international users from posting photos and videos and they said oh it's just like a service glitch or live streaming as well and mm. you're like that's obviously a lie right but we're going to play that game and say okay it's a, it's a, it's a glitch I, like when I first started that kind of stuff like blew me away but there was one time when I think uh, there were some rumours on Cena Weibo maybe it was like 2012 and the rumours about the, the bad rumours obviously about politics and they like disabled the comment feature for three days as a, as a punishment to the company which I thought was unbelievable um, so yeah like there's I mean I'm pretty interested in the, in the censorship thing I mean I live in Thailand so I let's not I let's not discuss that one but <laughs> I, I, I sort of see stuff with my own eyes too um, but the China example is always above and beyond what any other co- country would ever do so that's not of interesting um I think hardware as well. Obviously, we're in the right place at the moment. Uh, uh, Shenzhen is the hardware capital of the world, and we've seen some really, so many cool stuff here. Um, yeah. Yeah, for the censorship one, though, I do think that that narrative about government censorship gets exaggerated and overblown and um, simplified um, and applied to context where it's not, you know, it's not appropriate. Um, certainly. I don't know, you, you actually know better than me, but um, I get the feeling that when people want to write about China and they want to write about tech and they want people to read it, then the easiest way to do that is put the word censorship in the title yeah. somewhere. Um, which, uh, for topics and for areas where it's just not... OK, there is an aspect of that, but that's just the environment in China. That's sure. like your base level. Like, you have yeah. to work with the government policies, yeah. right? Okay, sure. But the actual real story has nothing to do with that. And I've seen that, and actually it really pisses me off. Right, right. so it could be any single person. The government is a big entity, right? It could be any single person, or like some kind of glitch or accident. It doesn't, it doesn't, everything doesn't always mean that the government, the whole government has said, like, this is bad, right? Yeah, well, it's Sometimes. just like the, the, stories, the story that they're trying to... They're trying to put censorship into a story where it's just not important. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't think that... 
I personally have ever done that. Well, maybe somebody will find the piece who I have. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think, um, but yeah, I think you're right. Like there is some element of shock journalism, right? Where like, oh, you never guess that China's banned this or that or whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, you get, again, it's it's an easy way to, to get page views. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, and fair enough. They got yeah. a job. They need to get. They're probably part of their KPI or, or their bonus. I think, I, I, think it's probably, I think probably Janice would be like, it's a lazy way to sound smart. Basically, yeah. I don't think it's about page views per se. Hopefully, people don't don't just do that that badly. I think it's more like, oh hey, like I found something really amazing about China, and I was so lazy that I'm not going to properly do the research and I'm going to run this story because I think this is amazing. Well, okay. Um, okay. So, so, so it's a bit different. It's a bit different. It's, le- it's less about. It's well, less about. I'm hoping that nobody just writes for pages. Well, sure. Maybe some people. Well, like but that's that's how BuzzFeed got started. Respectable media. Right. I mean, so, so obviously you have to. If you have a story, you have to be aware that like I spent an hour doing this story, so I should make sure that people actually read it. So there is right. one element of like trying to uh, uh, kind of pimp it up in terms of the, the, the how people could find well, it. Sure. I mean, Matt, Matt knows all about uh, about. Pimping Pimpin? things up. Yeah. Wow, well, I mean, this is <laughs> well, in it terms didn't of take long, did it? We we we, we talked a lot um, in, in yesterday um, about uh, clickbait titles and, and, and how headlines, uh, you know, because we're, it, we do a lot of stuff on WeChat and WeChat's, you know, is very very important. So yeah, I think that's what John's yeah. alluding to. <laughs> <laughs> not not my just general pimping. That's well, that's well something which, else. which you are. I mean, you are a pimp. Um, but um, he said it. But but when it comes to like you know like 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 bike sharing you know because you you've asked me a few times about this like is it is it really that big of a deal yeah you know is it is it really are they really making money and so again you know from from the outside you know what what's what's your impression of all this I, I think people are very skeptical from the outside mainly because uh, you see like Uber and Didi right and they're they're loosely seen as being from the same space and you've seen them literally burn through billions of dollars right across the world. And so there's, um, and because you know Uber launched this category of like, oh, we're like Uber for boats, Uber for planes, and you're like, oh, they're Uber for bikes. And yes, and the assumption from that is, well, they're losing an incredible amount of money trying to be Uber in a niche that doesn't exist. Right? That that's the mm. that's the conventional wisdom of how the U.S. media, I think, sees this kind of stuff. Um, and I try to not think like that. But when I thought about how cheap it is to use a bike. What would you pay like, like one, one yuan or whatever? Yeah, yeah. So or five mil. What's that in US dollars? Like, like, not point two dollars. Right. So not even that. It's yeah. Not even a dollar, right? And you're thinking to yourself, like, how on earth can this be a business? But I guess we're we're privileged that I can come here for sort of four days and speak to the guys that are running this company. And obviously, like, companies were never going to say like, yeah, we've got no way of making money. <laughs> Everyone's got like their their the dream. But when they explained it to me again, and I see like they have a data business and they have a services business that they're going to launch, right. you know, you see there's actually a lot more to it than just the, the bicycles. So, um, but I think many people just can't get past that, right? Mm. A lot of US media, and I read, yeah. you know, cynical people tweeting about mobile raising, you know, all that money on Friday, uh, six hundred million US dollars. You know, this is a waste of money, and all this and all that. And I mean, it's, it's a lot of money, right? And apparently, they're going to have to get more as well. Um, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that's what they sort of, uh, sort of said. Um, but I mean, the business is not just an Uber for bikes, right? And I think often people are quite lazy, and they maybe because of social media, you read a headline and you assume that you know the, the the full story. And I think there's a lot more to it than just the Uber for bikes thing. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting because it's, like it's and it's actually surprising in some ways um, that kind of response in the sense that you know if you're following tech these days. You would kind of understand that you know these 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 companies are not just building a service; they're also trying to build a platform. Yeah. Um, and that and that with you know the the increasing importance of data, it's not going to be just about the consumer facing stuff. It's also going to be about all the data that they're going to they're be collecting. Um, and unlike with Mobike, for example, one of the one of the things that they did from day one was to include like an estimate of how many calories you're burning, um, and and mm-hmm. being able and being able to feed you know these people who are into yeah. that type of stuff. Um, and get them hooked, and so like they're they're collecting all sorts of data, and and who knows how they're going to end up end up using it. And obviously, there's some pretty pretty obvious uh, use cases, 
But on the other hand, I mean, you know, it's not just about that consumer-facing service. Yeah, I think, I think the first time I realized that it was actually a legit business, or I mean, a, like an actual business that could be profitable and could be huge, just reading some of the stories that we republished from, from you guys. And it was like a, the sort of treasure trove of data that they, that they, that they had for yeah. the users was amazing. Like they could, there was so much insight that they could glean from that, from that data. And also one of them was, uh, there was a study about how uh, they, the, those two companies, uh, Offer and Mobike, had begun to replace uh, DD for, for like quite, quite a lot of people. So mm-hmm. they would get the subway and then they would cycle to work and cycle yeah. back. And even talking to like some of your um, some of your staff about how they use DD and they don't use it as much yeah. anymore. Yeah. That's when you realize that actually the, 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 the sort of hype, and there is a lot of hype right about them, is actually there is some, some reason behind it. So. Yeah, because as a user, like, um, yeah, you, you can you can go in Shanghai and it is faster. It's literally faster. I know from personal experience, like, and, and all my friends who use it, like, bike, subway bike beats taxi. Yeah. You want to get from getting A to B. So there's nothing worse than, like, calling an Uber or a Didi or whatever, and they're like, where are you? And you're like, well, it's in the map, man. Like, I know, exactly. This is why you have a map in your app. And they spend, like, ten minutes, like, you know, faffing around trying to find you, and you could have basically already got there if you had right. a bike, right? No, and it's, and it's funny, because I think I think a lot of it, you know, uh, has been about habituating users. And I know that, it, that, that I'm not used to using it at this point, because when I'm at home, I have my electric bike, which I take everywhere. Yeah. But when I was in Shanghai last, I was with one of our reporters, Linda, and we were going to go uh, meet, meet you, Matthew, at a, at a bar somewhere. And I'm, I'm looking at the map. I'm like, oh, God. But, like, you know, I take the bus and it's, it's all this stuff. I'm like, John, just take, a, just take a bike. I'm like, oh, duh. And it was, it was nice. You know, it, yeah. was, it was like we weren't in a hurry. Uh, the weather was, was, was pretty nice. The traffic wasn't, wasn't too bad. We just, you know, took our time. Well, that, that's, that's the idea. The, the, the user habits, I think, is the key. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, recently I've been really super excited about, it clicked in my mind, that actually Mobike is actually, doesn't need to be bikes, does it? It could be Mocar. It's a vehicle. It goes from A to B. And actually, they built up all the infrastructure. They've got all the data. They've got the user habits. They've got the phone. They've got the app on the phone that everyone uses when they think of going from A to B. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very possible that they could move into into cars, or yeah. autonomous cars, and, like, and, 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 and that's, that's something that nobody talks about. Right. But I'm they're sure doing, they're thinking of it. They're doing like services too, right? They're doing other things beyond that. So yeah, yeah. it would make sense that they would. Yeah, I mean, if they did that, I mean, I, I feel that's probably a reason why Tencent and Alibaba are so like so into it. They see because nobody really knows how it's going to go into an autonomous. Everyone knows it's coming. Yeah. But we don't know how it's coming, and actually, you know. Guys like Uber, guys like Mobike, who've got the apps on their phones and the user habits built up, their best place. It's not the technology. Uh, you know, the companies like Google or Baidu who are making the technology. Yes, the technology is very, very important. But actually, having uh, having that user habit built up um, is actually, I think, um, from a business perspective, just as important. That's a good point. Actually, it's annoying because I was going to ask. I was like, can I ask this weird question on stage with the with the CTO of, of Mobek? And I was going to ask him, like, are you going to do any other any other verticals beyond bikes? But we ran out of time, and I was mm. like, ah, uh, he probably would have said no anyway, or not commented. But actually, it's a very good point, and, and you're right. And I guess the best thing is, you had that weird tension with Uber, where they have like how many hundred thousand you know drivers who are like relying on them, or they call them entrepreneurs, right, or whatever mm. they, they, they they call them. And yeah, like when they have self-driving cars, those guys are going to be out of a job, right? But with mobile, there's there isn't that. Right? Yeah, they're actually in some ways better place. Right, it's just you and the and the tech. And they're talking about they have this IoT platform where they can they can build bikes and put them in any country, and they haven't got to worry about like the the, the carriers like being able to register them and so on and, and so forth. So they have built yeah like the platform where they could just put cars in. Right? It's, it's actually totally much closer there. to an autonomous vehicle than than, than yeah. the Uber system. Exactly, yeah. but but this is this is really interesting because you know um, like we we we've, we've talked with Steve Hoffman a while back and one of one of mm-hmm. his big points is like when you want to build a scalable company that can scale really quickly, dominate a market, and make a lot of money, you want to you want to create a two sided marketplace. Yeah, and so he was actually a bit bearish on on the bicycle sharing uh, companies because it's a one sided marketplace. Like you 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 don't have a buyer and a seller um, coming onto the platform to to trade trade services for money and said all you are is uh, a service a pure services provider yeah mm-hmm. also I mean I just wonder like is it a model that works in China because of the culture of, of bicycles here I just I mean 
there are some cities that it, where you just couldn't do it, right? Because people would actually die because it's like dangerous to, to, to have bikes. Like, I mean, it's, it's okay if you're a cyclist and you've been cycling for like five or ten years, right? And you know the streets. But imagine if there's like ten thousand people who are picking up a bike for the first time right. in the city. It well, and it's, it's happened in China. That, that's for sure. Mm. I mean, I, I mean, again, I drive an electric electric bike, and there are definitely times where I've almost crashed into people because it's like the first time that they picked up a bike in, yeah. probably, in maybe decades. Yeah. You know? So I just I just wonder like I mean I mean you guys probably know best cuz you're you know you're you're foreigners who are living here. So you've been mm. experienced here and, and elsewhere but like is this a model that can really scale like this in other countries? Uh, I think in other countries there'll definitely be much more regulation and much more um, sort of um, cynicism from people and uh, complaints from people here Chinese people are actually very accepting of change but super accepting of change because the society here has gone through like a gut wrenching change in the last 20 years um, people's lifestyles have come beyond recognition uh, you know it's expected that you know there's construction work going to be going on everywhere all the time <laughs> yeah. and, um, and and then things like this you know suddenly there's bikes on the street people are like yeah, well, you know, it's broadly a change for the good. Yeah. Whereas, if, you know, I'm from the UK. If, if that stuff happens in, in, in London, well, it is now. It's happening in Manchester. It's yeah. one of the first international places. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of people, um, yeah, um, you know, less used to such such a radical change. Yeah. I mean, I guess there are bikes in some parts of the UK, like hmm. uh, yeah. Boris bikes. Yeah, like, definitely. In London. And they're, they're very useful. Like, we did some, an event down there, and I cycled from the hotel to the, to the venue, and it was great. But then the whole like docking and undocking, and it's kind of more expensive than, than the, the, the bikes here. Yeah. The, the, the fortunate thing is the bike is it's got such a great reputation. Like it's it's eco friendly, it's it's healthy. You know, yeah. people think of bikes as good things. Like yeah. if it was cars, you know, if it, the polluting, you yeah. know, people and, don't like that. And, right? and, and the technology for EV is, is, isn't quite there yet. Yeah. But um, so yeah, we've been. T- Talking a lot about a lot about um, a lot about bike sharing and things like that, but I mean, like, like what about what about WeChat? I think one of the most interesting yeah. things for me, for you, all of you guys visiting, was talking with some of your colleagues and like trying to help them out with some problems that they've had with WeChat, like either like getting deregistered because of like security, like quote unquote security <laughs> uh, risks, um, and just having like just random problems uh, with with WeChat because like for like for Matt and I, like we just use it. And we hardly ever have any problems. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what what you know, what about WeChat? So, I mean, I've been like uh, re- writing about messaging apps for like five years, I guess. So I'm the original like messaging app nerd, basically. Like when they were all <laughs> when they were like very very small and they were growing fast. I was like, I was like writing about, like, yeah, this one has got like 10 million users now, like 20 million users, mm. and now what? WeChat has what? Like how many? You're coming on a billion. I uh, I mean, insane scale so I used to be really into it when it first started because it was like uh, you know when, 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 when Facebook grew right mm. I mean I, I think you, you guys were living in Asia at the, at, the, at the time right but I remember like I, I, when I moved to Thailand in 2008 Facebook just one day just blew up there was like nobody using it uh, you know one week and the next week there were like 5 million people and it, and it felt like, like that again where right. you know like, like Lion in Southeast Asia and WeChat in China and uh, Kakao in Korea they all just Blew up. It up, yeah, and literally just like grew so quickly, and it was so interesting what they were doing, and they were adding new features all the time, and and it was really exciting. And now I feel like it hasn't it hasn't stopped, but we already know that WeChat is huge already, right? We know this is massive, and it's got beyond messaging as like a platform, and you can do payments and so on and so forth. Um, so I mean, I'm honestly like, it's interesting, but it's so established and not like fresh and new again that I've kind of lost interest in a, in a, in a weird kind of, kind of way mm-hmm. it's, gotten, it's gotten so big right mm. what's the next big you know what, what's the next thing that's, that's going to grow at that kind of speed but, um, but yeah it's definitely interesting people who haven't lived in Asia don't have any clue right so they're used to using iMessage which is like the most boring <laughs> horrid well they have stickers now <laughs> do, people, do they use them though? and, and, and P to P P to P transfers? I think all these features are just are just you know added for the for the for the hell of it really. I don't think they're really that 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 well used. Um, but no, I mean for me, I, I love WeChat. I love coming here, and I don't bring business cards. I just scan everyone's code. I get them to scan mine. Um, and I think yeah, I mean it's, so, so for us at TechCrunch, we, we, we began to bring people over from um, the, the US and, and Europe for our, our events. 
and so I think yeah they, they've learned a lot more about about how tech is being is being used outside of where they're living and I think China's a great place to come and see that you know like you can I mean they, they can't believe that you can you can scan a bike with, with WeChat and you can take the bike you haven't got to get the app right and you can scan yeah. the, the, the battery packs and take the battery packs and so it's all very cool but unfortunately it's all stuff that is the, the Chinese WeChat only right so you right. guys have studied Mandarin read and write Mandarin and whatever like you, you get that but us you know that come here don't get all those features well we also have Chinese Chinese bank cards or, or wise the, Chinese bank cards and Chinese ID wise are the important ones, ones right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah so you, you get the full experience so even but even the half experience is still quite a lot for some people who, who haven't really seen it in action so yeah what are the common misconceptions you're seeing in, in from the, you know, you cover Asia, very, very different from the, the you know, this is a different world from the readership that, that who's actually reading your stuff. What are the frustrations and the misconceptions that you're seeing common, common, uh, commonly coming into with, with your stuff? I think, like we said earlier, you know, Otho is, is um, Mobuck are like Uber for bikes, right? It's just yep. this kind of like way to take a concept that's alien to you and to make it fit in a box that yeah. you can that you can handle right basically shop so um, but I, I don't think it's I, I don't mean really, not so much frustration I think I think it's more like um, I think it used to be the fact that people in the US and I'll, I'll talk about the US broadly because I, our audience is also in, in Europe and elsewhere but US is obviously the, the yeah I would say so right yeah um, and so yeah I think it's more like they just didn't really have an interest in Asia and I was like how can you be like that like this is a amazing stuff is happening mm. and there's like things that aren't happening in the US that are happening right here like you could learn from this it's really you know like things that are on the on the sort of bleeding edge of tech and how it's being used with, with, with consumers so how could you I mean, be so ignorant and um I mean, I never actually said that, but that was in my head. I was pretty like, yeah, yeah, all right, cool, yeah, whatever. It comes through in every word. So I, I think, um, but I think it's changing, right? So I mean, it obviously had to change, right? Because because mobile is is not really something that's massive in in, in sort of the West. I mean, I mean, it is, but it's not the sort of core platform like it is in, in the East, right? Where mobile is the internet, basically here, right? That's interesting. I mean, do you think it is like that? I mean, I for most people, sure. Yeah, you go. I mean, in like, the states, maybe, the phone isn't. The number one platform. I mean, you, you look at. I mean, so you look at our traffic to the TechNote website, and again, about forty percent, thirty-five to forty percent comes from the U.S. Um, and so we'll just use that as a number because that's what it says on Google, and we're not going to talk about VPNs and stuff, right? Um, but most of most of our traffic in total, so thirty to forty, thirty to forty-five percent from the from the U.S. Most of like seven, sixty to seventy percent of our traffic is coming from the desktop. But I mean, I mean, I mean, that's, I don't mean that audience though. I mean, just in general, like people, so people talk about like, oh yeah, like smartphones are opening the world up and there's like 6 billion when people are going to be on, on, online by, by this certain date, right? And the truth is like a lot of people like in Asia and also in China, I guess, in the rural parts of China, don't have like a, like a desktop PC, never probably had one, probably never will have one, right? right. Mm. So their, their internet is, is entirely mobile. It's not even like mobile internet. It's, this is internet. It yeah. is mobile. The internet. And I don't think that, like, um, the U.S. is not like that whatsoever, right? But, I mean, obviously it's changing. I, mean, I guess mobile is probably the, the primary internet device now. Um, yeah, and just, I mean, it's a genuine question because I feel like <laughs> I'm just so China-centric yeah. that I've lost touch with the West. Well, I mean, that's... It could be the same, but I think it may be... But, but, but primary versus only is not the same, right? It's yeah, I get that. I mean, I'm just thinking for, like, teenagers right now, right? The iPhone's been around for 10 years, yeah? So, like, in the States, I'm sure there must be teens who are in the same situation now, right? They, yeah. they only use phones. That's, that's, yeah. very, very, that's, that's, that's a very good point of that, of that segment. Yeah. yeah, especially that you were to, to uh, uh, Ted from uh, Kick, right? Yeah. So Kick is an app that's used a uh, messaging app that's heavily, heavily weighted towards teens, right? In terms of their user base, so I'm sure for a lot of those guys, uh, you know, they'd be using. But, you know, but I haven't said that. They've probably got an, uh, you know, they've got their their, their laptop as well. Yeah, but I, I, do, I do think the primary versus only is different. But it, I mean, yeah. but my point was that like that that's actually changed now because as you say, like like say like five years ago. Mm people had phones but they weren't using them as actively as, as they are now like the, the the teens would have had phones perhaps and we're not really a teen panel expert we haven't <laughs> yeah. had to guess <laughs> but confess. I mean but yeah. I mean how it's changed now like five years down the line is like mobile is 
it's so much more important for every single company, right? And now they're paying attention to China and they're looking at the trends that are happening over here because, because as I say, like when it's the when it's the primary platform, you can learn so much more about how people interact with, with online services or whatever. So I think and that was a frustration previously. Um, I mean, I, I'm in a good place right now because we've just had a good event for, for two days and it's it's a good it's a good crowd. So nothing immediately like comes to mind in terms of like frustrations and, uh, but you are seeing an uptick of interest in Asia oh definitely I mean how deep is that interest is a different topic I think some people just like to sound like they're smart because they're like oh yeah like in China like WeChat is huge and someone's like oh wow you, you really like cultured and you know a lot <laughs> I might have worked five years ago but now I think it's a bit like of a cliche kind of comment to make so I think that like yeah the, the level of interest is, is not always as high as it could be but I, I do notice a lot more people coming through Asia so guys who've worked in Silicon Valley or whatever maybe they've been at Facebook and they've taken some, some time off and said hey you know what like I want to go to China I want to go to Southeast Asia I'm going to India I want to see like how you know people are using the internet how they're, how it's affecting their, their, them on a daily basis and I might mm. learn something that I can take with me either I stay there and find something new to do or I go back and I use that, that experience to, to, to find the, the next thing to do so I think I think it is it is changing, but I mean, you know, people are inherently only concerned with what affects them, right? And so something that's halfway across the world, whether it's the U.S. for China or China for the U.S., is always going to be like not, you know, not the, at the forefront of everyone's everyone's mind, right? Definitely, definitely. Um, I see that when I go to Europe, um, the awareness of what's happening in Asia is very low, but it's understandable. Um, yeah. you know uh, it's not in their lives and so why would you care um, but then when you look at things like South Korean market and Japanese market you've got these brands that do have global recognition you know if you say to a European you know uh, South Korea they'll immediately think of a couple of different brands they'll, 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 they'll know it and they might even have a product from one of yeah. those brands and I think that change is going to happen with China you know you've, you've got some case studies now you've got Huawei um, Xiaomi, you got Xiaomi. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was it's, it's, it's phones right now, but I think you're going to see a lot more of them, um, and I hope this change will happen sooner rather than later. But it's it's definitely going to come, right? It yeah. has to come. I mean, yeah. the Chinese market is just so much bigger than Japan or South Korea. Yeah. It would be crazy that the, that, that 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 trend didn't play out in the same way, mm-hmm. and, and and in a lot stronger way. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I, I feel there will be some. Some uh, there has to be a, a big uptick uh, pretty soon. Once that st- once I think right now, you know, it's not in their lives. But when that change happens and they start, you know, actually uh, using brands uh, from China a lot more, then you're going to see a, a big switch in people's yeah, attention. I, I think when, you, when you're talking about about phones, I mean that's already happening in Asia, right? Outside of China, where mm. you know, like traditionally, like Samsung would Hoover up. You know, a lot of market share, or LG maybe would as well, and now Oppo and Vivo, are like, right? I mean, they're enormous, and they're actually becoming brands in, in their own right. So they have, you know, in Bangkok, they'll plaster out the the subway station with Oppo branding, and everyone has an Oppo phone. And mm. I just realized, like, one day I was like, damn, they're not just an upstart; they're actually the number one like brand now. People actually want to buy these phones. Right? Really? Okay, so that's Huawei, interesting. Like, Oppo. Yeah. On, so on the ground in Thailand, like what are you, what are you seeing in terms of chi- Chinese brands and, and the effect of the Chinese internet on, with that you know with that yes. market? So I think I think broadly like Southeast Asia um, is becoming. I, mean, I think you know, in your panel with the with the VCs, you guys sort of uh, touched on this a bit. It's becoming a market where like Chinese big Chinese tech companies are like coming in with like serious ambition, right? Mm. Um, and so, like, you're looking at like Amazon, thinking Amazon's in India, right? It's going to Australia. It's gone into the, into the Middle East. You know, it's done stuff in the US, spent like billions of dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what about Southeast Asia? And and I think Alibaba and Tencent are quite aware of that, and so they've just gone straight in. Obviously, Alibaba being being the the, the, the first one to get in. But now, like, and and financial is doing deals like everywhere, like left, right, center, like Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, like like they just they're, they're getting in as many companies as we crazy can early on and that means that Tencent I guess has to follow them because they're like well hey we don't have anything there like what do we have to do to, to get in there so they're also looking at deals too so I think India was was, was the first one right 
So that Alibaba like chose, you know, Paytm as its proxy there. Now Tencent just got in with uh, with a flip card deal as well. So I think like Sally Stage is sort of the the, the second part of that. Um, but in terms of what you said about about the brands, I mean, definitely smartphone brands are the most obvious one, right? Because everybody mm-hmm. wants a, a, a phone, right? Everyone needs a needs a phone, and like I'd say, Oppo is is interesting because it's come from nowhere and they've, they've spent a lot of money on, on, on ads. Right. So they'll like they'll like plaster out the subway station. They'll they'll take over like a like a subway train or whatever. Yeah. Um, with their, with their with their sort of branding, they're working with all the celebrities. It's like a it's a classic. It's what uh, Samsung used to do, right? Lots of sort of offline advertising, lots of celebrity advertising. Mm. Um, but they've just up their game basically and I'm not sure whether Samsung took the rise off, off the ball or, or that the Chinese guys just had more capital right that it's been interesting and what, you said it's happened recently so what is this in the last six months I'd or say in, in over, the- over the last year probably yeah and it's it's not the high end devices yet it's just sort of mid tier like $150 um, dollars, I guess like like, like, like downwards because people mm. will still buy iPhones and, you know, and Samsung Galaxies for their sort of high end phone but I mean, most of the meat of, of the market is in the sort of mid to low range phones and that's where like Oppo yep. and Vivo are really very very strong right 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 but you say very nice looking devices they're well branded they have the celebrity angle they have their, their logo and their name like everywhere mm. it's, it's kind of crazy and they got like the, the, the sort of selfie uh, the best cameras for taking yeah. selfies and they make sure it's whiter they, they, exactly they, they, they know what their audience wants yeah. well, and, 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 it's, and it's funny too because in, our, in a panel um, with, uh, with Meitu uh, which is a, a selfie uh, like touching like a beautifying application for selfie takers they, they have their own phone but, they, but uh, the CEO was talking about uh, the app and about some of the AI that they're trying to implement um, and how it's really kind of interesting because, like, the cultural differences even between how white women want their faces to be. And so he mentioned, like, in Japan, they want, like, the, the geisha, like, the, the stark white, kind yeah. of, like, very, very, very white, you know, like, bam. Yeah. Um, whereas in China, they prefer more of, like, a rosy white. So, like, a pinkish kind of kind of white as well. And so it's actually kind of interesting because I imagine in Thailand, maybe you don't, you don't know, but... I, in Thailand, my face is pretty good, right? You're a bit too brown. Too brown. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, so I imagine even in Thailand, you know, these are these are yeah, questions sure. that, that Oppo, Vivo, Meitu are trying to answer as well. But I think I think yeah, once they once they have that that, that data, then they then they can really like they can really double down on that audience, right? Because they know exactly what they what they sort of want. Um, but no, it's been really fascinating. I mean, I, I like I say, I don't know if it's Samsung taking a size off the ball or the the Chinese firms that are just hungrier but I think like Indonesia is, is also a market that they're really yeah. going after as well mm. so. I heard the same thing in Bangladesh uh, I was in uh, an airport I was in New Delhi airport a, a week ago and uh, I saw Oppo adverts there yeah. just to, you know in the airport it was obvious they had a presence mm. yeah I think uh, I mean there was a recent uh, study that uh, or a recent uh, analyst report that for the first time the top five best in smartphones none of them were, were Indian brands it always had the Indian guys that were sort of up there with um, Samsung and it was just only Chinese and Samsung as well right so yep I wow. think that's that, that's the first play right is it's just Asia first and I think like you know in a way it's easier because most people who are buying a phone whether it's Thailand or Indonesia or India they buy they, they have already have their SIM right? they have their, their phone number they've already bought their SIM so they're not spending like a huge amount of money. There's no operator that's going to give them like a like a you know zero percent over like so twelve months. They're looking for like the best phone they can buy for this, for this price. Right. So that's where like these Chinese companies can really do well. They bring the the innovation that you'd find in other devices and they pack it into a nice phone that's like 150 bucks, like rather than like 1,500 or whatever. Sure. Um, what the Thai Thai people. The, oh, the society <laughs> there. <laughs> what <laughs> you have to speak for all of yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, okay. what are you are you seeing any signals there of like how they're reacting to, to China? You know, these these Chinese brands coming in. And you ask me about Chinese tourists. They see the Chinese brands. I think. I mean, I don't think that people are thinking about like what country that the brands from. Really, I think that's the smart thing. Mm. Not doesn't mean that like China's a bad thing. For Mm. But this means that they're not competing at that level. They're competing at a level like 
you know, they're finding the right selfie apps or the right celebrity or the right you know, way to reach their audience. Hmm. I don't think they're pitching that as we're a Chinese company. You know, it's more like no. I, I mean, I would see it as being a handicap, perhaps. You know, like I know that uh, you know China. When you think China, they often like we talked about. You think of censorship. You think of yeah. uh, government control, and then you think, oh, what does that mean if I buy a Chinese brand phone? Sure, I think innovation is not. Yeah, I bet. I think people. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of tough, right? Um, but yeah, I think I think the the Chinese companies are doing really really well because they, they 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 know how to reach consumers, and in many ways, it's not that dissimilar to how they reach people who are living in sort of tier two, tier three cities here, right? Yeah, the, the sort of the sort of the sort of buyers thinking is probably very very similar right? um, but yeah outside of smartphones I mean I don't really I'm not a fashion follower and that, so I couldn't really I couldn't really tell you but I, I think the phones are the most obvious one because you know everyone everyone wants and needs a phone mm. and it's a very it's a very personal t- device that people people really care about what kind of phone they have um, and so I think yeah these companies have found a really good way to, to give like a, like a decent device at a, at a decent price so yeah I mean whether that works in Europe and the US I think it's a different kind of market there so it's much harder yeah but I think definitely India Southeast Asia they're having a massive impact there yeah mm-hmm. yeah um, in terms of software is there anything any Chinese companies making impacts uh, in Asia um, outside of China I don't think there's I mean, sometimes the selfie apps. I think Meitu does 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 pretty decent business in Southeast Asia. I think. Um, I mean, there are some. I think there are some independent Chinese games companies that will sprout up once in a while and like put out a title that does really well. But in general, like it's it's a pretty Western style, like Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Yeah, it's really hard to get past that, really. Yeah, I, I saw that myself last time I was in, in, in Bangkok. It's like yeah. everyone's addicted to Facebook there. I mean, Instagram is insanely popular now. It's just gone on to the next level. And YouTube is still popular because people use it for listening, listening to, to music, right? Mm. So um, I think, you know, I know like Baidu has tried some stuff, like Tencent has tried. I mean, actually, to be fair, Tencent does have uh, Jukes, their, 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 mm. their music app, which is kind of like QQ Music, right? But it's international version. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've never used it myself. I, l- I don't usually don't like talking about app unless I've actually downloaded Which it. Which one? And you, Jukes. So I mean, I've used it. Yeah, right. Um, so it's pretty. I mean, it? it's very localized, right? So Apple Music is available in, in almost every country. I think, apart from the usual suspects of like North Korea and 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 Syria and potentially maybe China. I don't know. If it's Apple, no, Apple Music is available. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. it is. Unlike unlike other other Apple content offerings. <laughs> mm. And. And yeah, like it's a very general product, right? It's not particularly lo- localized at this point. I don't know. Maybe yeah, that's why people don't use it in China. It's uh, but Jukes is high. Uh, Jukes is very like lots of Thailand related content. Mm. Uh, they work with a lot, lot of the the labels, so they have like their own uh, like like top twenty ranking. They even have like a massive. So near my apartment, there's a massive like uh, jumbo screen where they actually count down the top twenty songs of that that week and they wow. show the music videos and so they I mean Tencent is spending a lot of money on this I can, I can guarantee you because they're doing right. a lot of work and um, I mean I don't know the exact user figures but they're doing pretty well in I think Malaysia and Thailand um, and they've got ambitions to sort of grow it across Southeast Asia um, and they've also invested in a karaoke company called uh, Samu or Samu yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can tell I haven't used that one right <laughs> my, my, my my daughter used to use the the, the magic piano. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that so those that app is really popular as well in Southeast Asia. So I can see Tencent is going in, is thinking we're not going to win on on social right like Instagram, Facebook, they're all there. YouTube's there. They're trying to find different ways to get in. I think music is is an obvious right. one because as, as we were saying earlier, like if if your mobile is your only internet portal, then you're going to have to watch things, listen to music via that device. Sure. So they're building out uh, uh, content, and they've also done some deals to do media as well across Southeast Asia. They're, they're building out that that play because nobody else is doing that. Right, Facebook is just hosting content, mm. like really producing it in a particularly mm. focused way. So I mean, I mean that's pretty interesting. But yeah, but in general, like Alipay is Chinese tourists use it. I mean, you can use it in Bangkok pretty easily and yep. elsewhere, but it's really a Chinese tourist thing. 
Yeah. So I think I think Tencent has been pretty pretty smart about finding uh, an, an avenue where they can get in, in, into into somebody's sort of sort of phone and, and then going from there. I guess. I mean, Baidu had tried, you know, all these crazy AI powered search, but ultimately, like people features of, of habit, right? So they're already using Google or they're already using this one or that one. That's so it. That's they're it. not going to switch to Baidu, right? You have to, I mean, once you get in, users are in the habit of using an app for, for, for something, when you think music, you think jukes, right? Like getting them out of that habit onto another app, you could have the best yeah. AI, AI in the world, mm. probably still not going to do it. Exactly. As, long as, the, as long as the app that everyone uses um, is good enough. Or, or if you can get some kind of exclusive content deals or, or something like that. Right, that's how the video guys do it. Video, but also, but yeah. maybe you can do it in music, but at the, you have to get something. Like, it's because it's, it's, like, it's like that, that barrier of habit. And if you can get something just above that, maybe some people will, will, will jump over it, too. And at least try your... your, 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 your that is a good point. That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah. So yeah. I think, like, Baidu did... Did try and do stuff, and then Alibaba has taken a, a different approach, which is just just a buy up thing. Right? Okay. So Lazada, they bought. I mean, I don't know. But that wasn't a very good deal, right? Yeah, well, they ran out of money. Well, I'm not meant to say that because I get into trouble for saying that. Um, but <laughs> people told me that they ran out of money, and they they, they dispute this, but uh, and reportedly. It was, Yes, allegedly, not by allegedly. not by us, unofficially. <laughs> and yeah, so Tomas, like, is the Singaporean fund was a, was an investor in the company. They have good relationships with a lot of Chinese companies. I think they were the one that said to Alibaba, you know, hey, if you buy this this company, you're getting into Southeast Asia early, and it's a good time to do that. Amazon's like, yeah, yeah. And I think they, you know, they kind of said, okay, it's good, fine. Um, and they were going to buy them outright, but they just did a. They just bought most of the company at first, and I think they're going to close the deal like at some point in the next few months, probably. But yeah, so, so, but even then, like, it's a very fragmented. It's not like there's a single platform that dominates Southeast Asia or even any particular country. There's sort of like six or seven e-commerce platforms that want to be the Alibaba of Southeast Asia. Um, and I think it's more a case of like who the one that's winning is the one that's not losing as much money as the others at this point and obviously Alibaba has deep pockets and so they can continue to Lazada can continue, continue to, to sort of keep keep on going and they're, they're also tying up with Taobao so they've got some Taobao sellers that sell to Singapore at the moment and they'll do it in other countries too so so yes yeah, so there's kind of different approaches really like Baidu sort of tried to go head on and sort of failed Tencent has looked at ways that they can add to what's already here and Alibaba said okay which one do we do we do we buy it to, to sort of get in there interesting so yeah interesting. cool um, I've got a question I want to just take a step back um, talk about something a little bit different which is how do you decide you know what you're going to write about you're covering a huge area a Asia secret. I mean is it just yeah, down to you how's that what's process your, what's your secret sauce uh, how do you pick topics and is it, how much does it come down to your personal taste and interests so, so TechCrunch is great because uh, it's a very decentralised kind of system there's no editor who's handing me things I mean when there's stuff to be done obviously like we will, we will share it and the person who's around and the best, best place to do it will, will do it but essentially like um, you know, it's very autonomous so you, you sort of find your own stories uh, whether that's relationships with agencies, peer agencies, or companies, or just reading like the the sort of China tech blogs that we sort of mentioned earlier, right? Who, who were the first ones to, 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 to get the sort of scoops from China? Mm. It's a combination of, of, of things. Things really. I think getting out and meeting people obviously helps hugely. You know, hopefully, the next time there's a, there's a major WeChat feature, you can be like, "Hey, John, this thing is happening. Like, you should be covering this." And sure. Like, sort of get it from you. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's a real combination of, of things, um, but TechCrunch is a is a really you know we're we're a, we're, a, we're a new media company. Um, we have offices, but even in sort of San Francisco, not everyone goes in every every every, every week. So in some ways, like being in Bangkok is not that weird because the guys in SF go into the office like once every couple of weeks, right? So I mean I'm not that dissimilar to that in, in mm-hmm. some kind of ways. But I guess, like, yeah, how do you find a story? I mean, I guess I think hopefully the audience is kind of like me, so curious about Asia, right, wants to know more about Asia. We don't cover every single story because we just don't have enough people in Asia. There's only, right. there's only two of us in Asia, so we can cover every single, like, seed round. Once a company gets to, like, Series A or gets a certain kind of in, in, in 
invest they're putting into their company or does a certain kind of deal or has a certain number of users and suddenly it, it becomes uh, a thing that is notable on a, on, a, on a sort of regional basis, right? That's the rough kind of, kind of eye, I would say. But you could ask my colleague Catherine and she could say something completely different to me and that wouldn't be the, the wrong answer or the, or the right answer, right? Because it's about how you personally do it. But yeah, so I would say it's things that sort of are interesting on a, on a, on a regional basis, really. Okay. But you could, I could still cover your seed route if you're doing something that's amazingly innovative and interesting, right? It doesn't mean mm. that I wouldn't mm. do it. So, I mean, I just, there's no real, there's okay. no real rules. <laughs> I'm going to ask you guys what you think about TechCrunch and also international media as well. How, you, how they're reporting on China. Give me, give me your honest opinions. This is, this is uh-huh. definitely good. Okay. Like, like, which media do you read? Like, which media do you trust? Which ones do you not trust? Like, anything, any common things that you see where you're like, oh, this again, really? I think I touched upon the, the, the big one that I have, which is that just uh, I'm seeing narratives about China, which I think are lazy and not true. Um, and, it, or, you know, they're, they're not, 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 not lies, but like exaggerations right. like, and, and, and just a, a skewed view of like what's actually driving stuff here. And also an arrogance of people. We talked about for bike share, like assuming that Chinese companies are just throwing their money away and they have absolutely no idea what they're doing. They're yeah. just like following trends and these guys are complete idiots. Like Tencent's investing this. They have no idea what they're doing. Tencent is like so strategic. They know exactly what they're doing. Like if Tencent invests in bike share and they put 600 million into the thing, they've, you can bet your life they've got a serious plan behind it. And it's the guys who are actually the idiots are the people who are saying that <laughs> they're idiots. It's like uh, people who uh, are analysts, you know, who uh, really d- don't have deep knowledge of what's going on. They've got a very superficial understanding of what's happening in the market. And then they're saying that Tencent or whoever is completely stupid for doing this. Like, that, uh, okay, you can say many things about the trends, but you can't call these companies stupid. No way. Yeah. Like, they're, they're, there's obviously a plan. And if you don't know what it is then you, you know, you're the one who hasn't, you know, <laughs> if you, you haven't figured it out, then perhaps you need to, you know, go back and look at it. Um, well, even then, I mean, like, I, I would say that when it comes to China coverage in general, uh, I think that, like, uh, The Economist actually does a pretty good job with their, with the China mm-hmm. coverage. They have, they have people based mm-hmm. here, um, but they had, a, they ran a story on, on bike sharing uh, not, not too long ago, maybe about a month, month and a half ago, and it was, it was really kind of interesting, just, it, it was either, it was either, like, factual inaccuracies or maybe like uh, compromises that they were making for their writing uh, for for their, their their global audience where it wasn't quite actually reflecting what's actually happening there was and so for me you know obviously I'm pretty familiar with what's happening and so this when they when they overlook a detail or when they when they you know uh, misstate something it's, I mean, and it's not like it's a glaring error but it's something that's just still not quite true yeah that that, that can be quite frustrating but when it comes to like you know other other international media covering China and China tech, I mean, the information is doing a wonderful job. Yeah, they're doing a super super great job in their China coverage, um, and it's one of those things. I mean, I, I pay for a subscription pretty much for their China coverage mm. um, yeah. because the other stuff that's happening in Silicon Valley isn't all. I mean, it's it, I, it's not all that interesting to me. I'm not too interested in the ins and outs of like Airbnb's corporate structure. You know, I mean, some people are. I'm not. Um, and, and again, I mean, I would say, you know, uh, at uh, Lulu Chen at Bloomberg does a great job with her China coverage. Um, and that's that's about it. I mean, obviously, you know, Tech in Asia, um, they, they have a really good China coverage as well. Again, people based here on the ground. Um, that's basically it. Yeah. yeah. Um, with, 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 like, with other, other tech media, like with TechCrunch, um, I, I read, I read, I have like a, an RSS reader where I just put in like a, di- a lot of different uh, news, news sources, including Chinese tech sources. And so every morning I just kind of flip through it to, kind of yeah. s- to get a sense of kind of what's, what's going on and also source stories for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, because one of the, the mistake that I made when I first started doing this was like, okay, I'm only going to pay attention to China news. Uh, but then if you only do that, there's, there's larger global trends yeah. that you're missing. Yeah, um, yeah, and definitely. So, and so now, what I do is I look at everything, but just not not all that deeply. Yeah, definitely. You got to. It, it's all connected, right? But um, having said that, China is. Uh, if, if there's one part that is separate, it's, it's China. It's, yeah. it's 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 got so so many different 
uh, things that are, are, are have made the market almost like a, an intranet in itself um, and the because the ecosystem there has got so many differences that have been built up over time then you know everything that builds on top of that is is by has to be different by uh, because of that um, yeah, well, there's one thing I was going to say. Um, yeah, the Chinese sources. I, I think for me, like uh, it's it's always about um, that the best stuff is always in Chinese. Um, so it's always a matter. I just pay much more attention to local sources than anything internationally because they're always slower. The, the coverage is um, always like far more superficial uh, because it has to be right. It has to be accessible to to the international audience. So they're not going to go deep. Uh, as you'll get in Chinese, so uh, for me, as and and the challenge uh, that I, that we're increasingly running into, and that we want to um, be a part of um, of solving, is is making that deeper analysis more accessible yeah. um, to 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 a wider audience, which is actually really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny because Matt and I, when yeah. like our second or third episode into it, we're like, hey, wait a second, who are we actually trying to target, and with with this podcast? And, and what we came up with was, you know, in a broadest sense, you know, people who are who are tech watchers but are also interested in what's happening in China. And and it's kind of funny because I'm not I'm not actually I'm not quite sure how good of a job we've done in in keeping that audience in mind. Just because when you do a deep dive on what's happening yeah. in, in tech in China, you know, like you can lose people very easily. Yeah. yeah, that's what definitely definitely what we, definitely it's we, a real we challenge. Feel that a lot as well. Yeah. yeah, you have to be very careful about the assumptions that you make of like, do I need to explain this term, yeah. you know, or, or is it like, is that, because you can never get it right, right? You can explain some terms, yeah. you know, if, if you're writing for a very big global audience, you're going to have to explain what Baidu means, like, yeah. yeah. It's like you're in a class of 40 people and you, you've got to yeah. keep in mind that there are some who are a little bit behind and others right. who, are like, who are like already bored, they've already done your, your maths problem in, right. like, in like two they're seconds. Done. And yeah. they're like, what yeah. do you do next? They're swinging on the, on the tables and the chairs. Right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you've got to keep everybody, like, you, you, obviously you, 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 you can't, you've got to do one simple thing, so you've got to keep in mind the ones that are a little bit slower. So yeah. I see one of my pet peeves, actually, I've just remembered one of them, is people who think that they know everything about China or everything about Asia. Right, because nobody, no, no such person exists on this planet. Right, because the best people are ones who are always keen to learn more. Right, nobody knows everything. Mm. So if you read like a reporter or anybody or an analyst who thinks they have Asia, especially Asia, because Asia is such a phenomenally huge place and it's so diverse and different. So they, they think they understand it. India tech. I got it like locked down or China tech. Um, impossible. Exactly. Impossible. Well, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's true. I mean, it's true of like Chinese culture. I mean, there was there was one point I'd been here for like one or like one or two years, and like uh, and like uh, up until that time, I was like, I understand China. I know what's going on. And then something happened. I was like, hey, wait a second. Actually, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> yeah, the best people are the ones who are always curious, always learning, yeah. and don't assume they know everything. Right. right? Well, but I think I don't think that that's super important. I mean, obviously, obviously, you have a lot of knowledge, you have a lot of accumulated ex- experience. There's always more to learn. There's yeah. always more. Absolutely. That's that's like there could be that one data point that just like flips your opinion on it. And especially in tech, because tech is yeah. always changing. Especially Asia tech, right, and China tech. So you you can never know everything. Yeah. Um, so I think some people yeah. out there like shocking themselves as sort of the sort of experts in China tech, and they're not. Yeah. It's such a challenge to keep up. Well, and it really I, is. And, and on that note, I think um, that's probably about as far as we want to go. With, with John um, one of the ways that we like to wrap it up is if anyone wants to get in touch with you uh, if, if anyone wants to find you where yeah. where should they do that uh, so probably uh, I, I tweet a lot so probably Twitter which is uh, John Russell my, my, my name is my handle um, but you can just email me if you want and find me on, on, on Google for that thanks so much for yeah, having cool. me yeah no we're, pleasure we're, yeah thank you thank you so much and if you enjoyed this episode Please make sure you leave a, a review on iTunes or press that little star button on Overcast. It really, it's a great way to uh, to show your support for this podcast.